Have you ever heard of the television show, The Bachelorette? Um, <clears throat> it's a reality TV show where one woman is given the opportunity to date like 20 different guys. <clears throat> Here is the latest Bachelorette with all her suitors. Um, <clears throat> and it's sort of like um, <clears throat> Survivor. Like she votes them all off the island and in the end there's only one and that is hopefully her true love. Um, but when the field is, by the way, I don't watch this show. <laughs> when the field is narrowed to four guys, they get to go on what's called a fantasy date. And they are given the option to sleep together and apparently at times they have sex together. Um, now in my mind, if you are looking for a spouse, to do so on national television through a survivor process and then sleeping with somebody you first met is probably not the best way to go about it. Um, but I'm a little old fashioned, so. Um, <clears throat> but recently there was a media storm over this TV show because the bachelorette pictured there is actually a self-professing Christian. And one of the contestants on the show was likewise a self-professing Christian. And uh, he made it to the the later rounds. And in one of their, um, I guess, dates, he talked to her about sex. And here is the scene where he's having this important discussion. Um, and the young man said he had made mistakes in his college years, and he has repented of those mistakes. And he had been celibate for four years, and intended to remain celibate until he was married. And he said to her that he believes that sexual relations is only authorized by God in marriage. And he said, I want to confirm with you that you're on the same page with me. And I also want to confirm that on these fantasy dates, you're not going to you know, do anything inappropriate with these other guys. Well, the bachelorette was very offended by this line of questioning and scolded this guy for being judgmental. In fact, I have a picture of her scolding. <laughs> it looks like somebody dropped an anvil on her foot. Like, <laughs> she said, how dare you judge me, is basically what her message was. And then she had this line that's really been picked up in the media, which is, uh, yes, I had sex, but Jesus still loves me. And then she later tweeted, I am standing firm in believing that Maybe God wants to use a mess like me to point to his goodness and grace. <clears throat> so it's really, a, I think, a fascinating situation. You know, if the bachelorette is a Christian, then she is absolutely correct uh, that through the grace of God, she is forgiven for her sins. Absolutely. Um, but don't you just squirm a little bit <laughs> at, you know, her story here? I mean, she seems to have intentionally sinned and has expressed no remorse or repentance and simply says, <clears throat> I'm covered by grace. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. Uh, the Apostle Paul addressed this very argument in Romans chapter 6, where he wrote, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So in other words, sh should the Christian keep sinning because the more you sin, the more God extends his grace, and grace is a good thing. <clears throat> well, Paul gives an emphatic answer in the next verse. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So Paul says, no way. The Christian should fight against sin at all times. Now, we stumble and we fall, absolutely. But we're supposed to fight the fight. Through, through the strength of Christ. And other parts of the Bible drive home this point. For example, Hebrews 12, 14, where it says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So you break that down. What are we to strive for? Peace and holiness. Holiness is something we are supposed to strive for. Peter said the same thing in 2 Peter where he says, uh, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, 
so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Don't supplement your faith with sin. Supplement your faith with virtue. So in summary, the Christian is not perfect. <clears throat> the Christian is going to stumble and bumble, as we all well know. But the buzzwords here I want you to think about are from these verses. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to strive for holiness. Make every effort toward holiness. So going, turning back to the bachelorette, um, <clears throat> I believe she dishonored Christ um, in intentionally sinning and then sort of shrugging it off and just playing the grace card. And by contrast, I think that that young man honored Christ by confessing past sin, um, regretting that sin, and, and striving toward sexual purity. And um, <clears throat> we can find a wonderful example of all these lessons in one parable of the Bible. And that is the parable we're going to talk about today. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in this um, parable, <clears throat> we're going to walk through this, but we will see that it is impossible for anyone, the Christian included, to live by God's perfect standards at all times. It is impossible. Secondly, we will see that we are still to strive and make every effort to live by God's perfect and lofty standards. And then third, this parable, <clears throat> I'm sure you all know it very well, it does not deal with um, sexual sin, so we're going to move off that subject. But in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus lays out for us how we should love our neighbor. And the standard is impossibly high. But again, we should be striving toward that standard. So let's read the parable and carefully examine what Jesus taught. We'll pick it up in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. <clears throat> and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. <clears throat> now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. All right, so here's the scene. We have an expert in the Old Testament law talking to Jesus. And we learn two important facts about this expert. The first is that he... He comes to Jesus with a flawed theology. The expert says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And built in that 
into that question is a false premise because there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. You can't earn it through good deeds. You can't earn it through compliance with the law. Uh, The Bible says, by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. So he's coming in, the expert in the law, with a flawed theology. He also comes to Jesus with a flawed motive. What are we told about him? We're told he wanted to put Jesus to the test. He's not earnestly seeking the truth. He wants to catch Jesus. He wants to expose Jesus as as some type of charlatan or a bad teacher. We're told he wanted to justify himself. So he wanted to have a dueling debate where he comes out as the smart guy and Jesus comes out as the dummy. So he's not coming to this whole discussion with a proper heart. Um, But the expert begins by asking Jesus a question, and that's actually a very good way to explore ideas, is to ask questions, and to do that in a discussion with somebody. In fact, in law school in America, the teachers do not give you the law. They don't give you the answer. They just ask you questions. So, like, for example, if you were attending a class in criminal law, uh, the, que- the professor might say, um, you know, Mr. Shaver, uh, if I punched you in the nose, would that be a battery on your person? And then it would continue. What if I swung a punch at you and missed, but you felt the breeze from my punch? Would that be a battery on your person? Or how about this one? How about if I swung at you, I miss, I hit a bookshelf, the bookshelf falls and hits you. Am I guilty of a battery? Or what, hey, what about this one? If, I, if you're sitting in a car and I punch the car on the hood, is that a battery against your person? Is the car an extension of you? What if I smash the window right next to your head? So you can go on and on and on. It's exploring ideas through questions. And that's what this expert in the law is endeavoring to do. And he actually asks the most important question in the universe. How do I inherit eternal life? Which is how do I get to heaven? It's the most important question there is. And I will give credit where credit is due. The lawyer starts with the correct framework. He knows from scripture that when you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell. And not everyone has that framework, especially in our culture. So uh, I was reading Fox News. Uh, Not that I think Fox News is great, but I was reading it last week and... um, There was a story about John Travolta, who was a Scientologist, and it was a story about um, this tragic death of his son. The son was 16, and John Travolta was with the son in the ambulance, and the son died. I'm not sure how it, or why he died. Uh, But Scientologists believe that everybody has a spirit in them called Thetan. And Thetan, when you die, finds another body to use and inhabits that body. So it really sounds like reincarnation to me. Um, but like a strong Scientologist can command Thetan to, to go back into a dead body. That's their belief. So it was just, to me, a very sad picture of John Travolta in the ambulance commanding Thetan to go back into his dead son. Um, It's just so sad to see somebody so lost in their view. Um, Because we know from the Bible, it is appointed once unto a person to die, and then the judgment. And there's no thetan that you can command to go back in the body, and there's no thetans wandering around looking for bodies. Um, So at least the lawyer in Luke chapter 10 started from the right framework and had a correct understanding of heaven and hell. And here he is. He's in front of the most important person of the universe who has the answers. So let's, let's follow along. Let's see what happened. Instead of giving a direct answer to the question, Jesus was, he was like a law professor. He said, uh, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer, he, he nails the answer. He crushes it. 
but he doesn't understand the implications of the answer. He correctly sums up the moral law. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says, right on, do that and you shall live. Now, what should his reaction have been at that point? His knees should have been knocking, right? That, what Jesus said would be like, it would be like me going to Augusta National where the best golfers in the world have played and the course record is a 63. And it's like Jesus saying to me, oh, go, go shoot a 40 on Augusta National, Chris, and you'll go to heaven. Wait, I, I can't do that. That should have been the lawyer's reaction to this. Because let's break this down. Is there anybody who can say with a straight face that at every point in their lives, they have loved God with all their heart, which is all your passions, all your soul, which is the inner core of who you are, all your strength, which is your energy, all your mind, which is your intellect. Can anybody say at every moment in your life, you have done all of that? Not even close. <laughs> Nobody's even close to that. Um, can anybody really say they love their neighbors as they love themselves? Maybe at times, but all the time to every person? Absolutely not. So the lawyer should have been like, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> but instead, he, he kind of, he he goes into the intellectual dance. And he, remember, it says he's trying to justify himself. And he says, well, who's my neighbor? Um, and that's when Jesus goes into the parable. And you know this parable, I'm sure. A Jewish man is robbed. He's stripped. He's beaten. And left half dead by the side of the road. First, a priest walks by. And you would expect a priest as a man of God to see somebody in need and uh, want to help that person. Wouldn't you expect that? But of course here that doesn't happen. The priest actually goes to the other side of the road and just keeps on moving. Um, it reminds me of when I was a teenager with my sister and we had this relative who's an adult but he's like, if, you, if they had pictures of nerds in the dictionary, it would be this guy. <clears throat> and so we're walking with this nerd, um, and all of a sudden he falls down. And there's all these other people around us, and the nerd falls down, and he starts going, ow, ow, like in this like, horrible screech, ow, I twisted my ankle, ow. And uh, my sister and I just kept on walking, like we didn't know the guy. <laughs> In fact, we kind of picked up our pace a little bit. You know, like, <laughs> um, and that's sort of like this priest was with this injured person. So second, who comes by? A Levite. And a Levite, remember, is in the priestly line. They work in the temple. So you would, again, you'd expect, hey, this is a guy, got to be sensitive to the needs of others, right? Um, but of course, he keeps walking on by. And he also, by the way, moves to the other side of the road. Um, Third person comes, and that's a Samaritan. And when you hear a Samaritan, um, you should immediately think the Samaritans and the Jews, they hate each other. They are enemies. So here's a Samaritan who sees an injured Jew, and he becomes the role model for all of us. And the standard he followed is impossible for us to achieve at all times but it is certainly something worth pursuing. Strive for, make every effort toward. Okay, so let's, let's break down what this good Samaritan did. Why is he our role model? Well, we're told first, he had compassion on the injured person. And that's really the first step to helping somebody, right? You have to care about somebody before you even desire to help them. Um, I was working on a transaction recently, and in the transaction was this mega millionaire guy. 
has hundreds of millions of dollars in commercial real estate, and he adds five or six new properties every year. And uh, I, his lawyer, unsolicited, was telling me about this rich guy, and he said, you know, this guy, he's got no wife, he's got no kids, he's got no friends, he doesn't socialize, he doesn't give to charity, he just likes to build this portfolio of properties. And I, I did think how sad it is that he doesn't seem to, you know, care about other people. Um, so the first step is the, this good Samaritan, unlike the priest, unlike the Levite, had compassion on the injured man. Well, secondly, the good Samaritan made time. He made time. He stopped where he was going. Wherever he was going, he stopped. He interrupted what he was doing and made time to help somebody. And this is a large stumbling block to many of us because we're so busy with our lives, we fill so much of our lives with self-centered pursuits, we do not leave enough time to help others. So Pastor Kim last week, he talked about the screw tape letters, which is a fantastic little book about demons trying to attack people. Uh, that's a great read, by the way. Um, and it's pretty short, too. Um, but do you remember what the head demon said to the junior demon? He was like, our job is easy. Just keep them distracted. If you keep them distracted, they don't think about salvation, and they definitely don't think about helping others. Um, and it's so easy, it's so easy to fall into that trap. But here, the Good Samaritan, our role model, did not fall into that trap. All right. Third thing the Good Samaritan did here. He took action and hands-on action. He poured oil and wine lavishly on the wounds. And so the wine is like an antiseptic and the oil is something soothing. So it's like medicine he's putting on these wounds out of his own resources. Um, he bandaged the man. He put the injured man on his own donkey and went to the inn. So it would be the equivalent of like, I don't, I don't, I don't have a good equivalent today, but he, he basically, the, the Samaritan had to walk while the injured man got to go on a ride to the inn. And what did he do at the inn? He helped the man and stayed with him all night because you see, it was the next day when he had the conversation with the innkeeper. So he stayed with this guy all night. So it's easy to talk a good game about loving others, but talk is cheap, isn't it? Action is what matters, even action which requires personal sacrifice. And I, I will tell you, this was the easiest part of the sermon to find illustrations because our church lives this out. Um, I'll just give you one example. I remember last year, I think it was last year, Kate Funk was visiting Nancy McIntyre in that adult home she lived in. And Kate has ministered to Nancy faithfully through, over the years um, <clears throat> until Nancy passed away this year. Well, on one visit on a sweltering summer day, uh, Kate discovered that all the air conditioning units in this adult home were broken. And so all the residents are in there in just sweltering heat. It was like a day like today. Can you imagine? And I just love our church so much. Um, immediately, Norb puts out a message to the church. It says, who will buy air conditioners for these people? And we actually had to turn people away. <laughs> we had so many people willing to buy these air conditioners. And then Norb sent out a message. Who is willing to help install these air conditioners? And, of course, people volunteered to help. So we put air condition, an air conditioner in Nancy's room and in every room of that residence, I think even in the common areas, we stocked that place full of air conditioners. That is an example of love in action. We aren't just saying, oh, Nancy, we love you, and then turning away. <laughs> you know, we leaned into it as a church. Here's another example. Um, look at this church. Look at the decorations. We're heading into one of the great weeks of where this church shines like, 
like no other in my view. It's VBS week. And if you haven't gone down to the kids area, even if you don't have a kid, go look at it. It's spectacular. And every year we put this on for kids for free. And there's mega churches in this area that charge like 100 bucks for this type of stuff. We, we, we charge people for free. But guess what? People in, that's because people in this church open up their wallets and pay for this stuff and make it free for other people. That's love in action. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and I love our church for that. All right, let's look at the fourth thing the Good Samaritan did, our role model here. He used his personal resources and expected nothing in return. In fact, that payment, that two denarii, like to us, what's a denarii? I mean, it could be two nickels for all I know. Apparently, that's like worth, it's a lot of money. It's like paying for it. Most people think it's two months stay for this guy. Two months to stay. Um, so sometimes when you ha have to help other people, you actually have to bust open your wallet, let the moths fly out, and pull out some Benjamins or George Washington's or Abraham Lincoln's, as the case may be. But what you have, you, we are supposed to give. And when I think of generosity, I, I think of Joseph of Arimathea. <laughs> Remember Joseph? He's the guy who got permission from Pilate to take Christ's body. Joseph was apparently a very wealthy man, but he gave his tomb to Jesus. And, you know, to, we don't totally get how big of an act that is. Those tombs were uber expensive, only available to the super rich. And um, they had to be cut out of a hill. It takes a lot of manpower. And it's scarce real estate for this stuff around um, Jerusalem. Um, and those of you who have taken economics in high school or college... We know that when there is a small supply of something, what does that do to the price? That's right, the price goes up. I remember, um, I remember taking economics in the, I totally blew this, the, the, and I was an economics major, so <laughs> the professor said, explain to me the paradox of diamonds and water. And he said, why is water so cheap and di why are diamonds so expensive? Because we need water to live. We, you don't need diamonds, right? Um, look at my wedding ring, $15 wedding ring. Um, Jen got a pricey one. I think it was $18. So. <laughs> but, of course, it gets down to supply and demand, right? It's, there's lots of water, so that's not... But diamonds are very few. Um, so here, this rich guy gives a tomb, which is a very substantial gift to Jesus... And then in Matthew, it's very interesting. He gets Jesus' body, he lays it in the tomb, the stone is ro rolled in front of it, and in Matthew, you know what we're told J Joseph does? He sits around and he, and he says, hey, who's going to pay me for this? No. No, he says, hey, uh, anybody, did you see what I just did right there? You want to, my back needs a little patting. Can you just reach over there and pat my back? No. It just says he went away. You know, Joseph didn't expect anything out of this gift. He's given it to a dead guy. He didn't expect anything in return, and yet he did it. And that's like the Good Samaritan here. The Good Samaritan doesn't expect to get those denarii back, but he's willing to give them. All right, so look at this. This is quite, quite um, a lineup. And if you're like me, you're looking at this list right now of these four items, and you're thinking, well, I think I'm 0 for 4 on these. I think I'm batting 0% on these things. Um, but for those of you who might be thinking, you know, I've nailed these. I, I do this all the time. I've got these first four down pat. Well, I'm going to try and burst your bubble here with the last two observations. Um, the fifth thing the Good Samaritan did here was he pledged financial support without limit. Did you notice that? He said to the innkeeper, he said, here's two denarii, I'll come back. Whatever the cost is to take care of this guy, I'm good for it. He didn't put a cap on that. He said, I'll pay for anything up to another two denarii, but 
No, it was, whatever the cost, I got this covered. Pledging unlimited support. Um, now, can you honestly say you've pledged unlimited financial resources to help another person in need? That's a very tall order. But if you think you've done that, I'm going to try and knock you out with a six one. I think I can knock you out with this one. Maybe you, maybe you could do all six sometimes, but not all the time, especially number six, because remember here, the Good Samaritan for number six was willing to help an enemy. This wasn't his wife, wasn't his kids. This was an enemy. Um, I just don't know. I would need a supernatural change of my heart to, to do that for an enemy. Um, I was thinking this morning, uh, and for some reason, I, I thought about 9-11. Um, and I remember that day so vividly. I was at work, and I heard what happened, and I immediately wanted to get home and be with my wife and kids. I only had two kids at that point, and they were just so little. And But I just remember that day and that week, I was so angry at Al-Qaeda. Like, I was just so angry. Um, wanted bad things to happen to all of them. And Osama bin Laden, you know, I wanted his head on a platter, you know. Um, and I thought this morning, could I, have, could I have at that time, if I saw somebody in Al-Qaeda in need and in help, could I have been like the good Samaritan to that person? Eee, that would be a hard one. But that's what the good Samaritan did here. And then I thought, okay, well, that's kind of an extreme example, you know, knocking down towers. And What about like somebody at work? that has wronged me and I don't like that person and all of a sudden that person gets hurt or is vulnerable am I willing to help that person or put my foot on their neck and make sure they <laughs> suffer more um, I'm supposed to be like the good Samaritan it can even be something silly like um Somebody was a little mean recently to my wife, and uh, I'd like to strangle the guy. So, um, but again, that's not the walk. I'm, I'm supposed to be striving towards something different. I'm supposed to be different than the rest of the world when these things happen. So helping an enemy. There you have it. Um, I submit to you, this standard of the Good Samaritan is an impossible standard for us to achieve at all times. And I think that's why Jesus presented this parable to that lawyer. He was trying to get that lawyer to realize in his self-righteousness, you can't fulfill the law. God tells you to love your neighbor. This is what it's supposed to look like. He was evangelizing that lawyer. Um. So it's an impossible standard, but this is our standard to pursue. So based on this standard, I have for you to conclude bad news, good news, and the best news. What do you want first? You want the best. <laughs> Everybody else is like, bad, Connor. <laughs> Give me the best. All right. Uh, we'll do the bad news first. Um, you're never going to be able to achieve this standard. I'll just break it to you right now. It's impossible to do this at all times. It may be even be hard to do this once, honestly, all these things. But here's the good news. Um, Jesus lays out this perfect standard of the Good Samaritan, not with the expectation that we will always achieve this standard, but it's for us to remember our buzzwords, strive toward, make every effort to achieve the standard. And everybody can do this. We can all try, right? Here's the best news. If you're like that legal expert and you think your good deeds will get you into heaven, you think you can do this all the time, God has a better offer for you. You are a sinner. You can never please God with your good works. But Jesus pleased God by living a perfect life 
And the Bible says that in God's eyes, you can be cloaked in the perfect righteousness of Christ and forgiven for your sins if you do two things, and that's repentance and faith. <clears throat> the Bible says if you repent of your sins, which means be sorry for your sins, turn from your sins, and put your faith in what Christ has done, you will be saved. You will be saved from your sins. And I think back to that bachelorette, like I, I think her use of the term, well, Jesus loves me, is a little bit off because Jesus loves everybody. He loves sinners. He, it's, you're not instantly loved by God because you're a Christian and a believer. You were loved before that. In fact, that's why he sent his son to die for you. So her word was a little wrong. I think what she was really saying is, I, I'm cleansed of my sin. I'm righteous before God. And that is a true statement. That is absolutely a true statement. If you have repented and put your faith in Christ and Christ alone. If she has done that, then she is, she is actually correct. Even though I think she has dishonored Christ, I think that, well, I know that in the eyes of God, and this is so amazing, he only sees her in the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see all the warts and distortions of sin. So I do hope that she has done that. And I hope that you do as well, if you've never done that. All right, well, let's close in prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, um, I thank you that we have the recorded words of Jesus Christ to study. Um, I thank you for this lesson that Jesus gave us. I thank you for the knowledge that we can never live up to your standards, Lord. I thank you that you tell us more and more about your standards. And, and when you do, God, we realize how inadequate we are and how much in need of a Savior we are. Um, but Lord, I also thank you that you give us a chance to strive toward these perfect standards and to grow year by year in our sanctification. And um, God, please help all of us here. Help us to love our neighbor better. Help us to be more and more like the Good Samaritan every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.